The concept of nationalism has been a crucial part of modern history, though its detailed study gained significant attention only recently. Benedict Anderson's influential book Imagined Communities defines the nation as an imagined community emerging with the decline of feudalism and the rise of capitalism. According to Anderson, the bourgeoisie created new forms of community that transcended class and religious divisions, utilizing newspapers, novels, and other communication methods to foster a sense of shared identity within a defined geographical area. Newly formed states like those in the Americas during the late 18th and early 19th centuries did not initially define themselves by language. For example, Spanish-speaking Creole communities in South and Central America developed a sense of nationness early on, including indigenous non-Spanish speaking peoples into this idea. This form of nationalism arose from both dispossession and privilege, a duality seen later in various anti-colonial movements. In Europe, Anderson highlights that language significantly shaped national consciousness. The literate middle classes and intelligentsia played key roles in this process initially promoting a language-based inclusive nationalism. However, ruling dynasties and aristocrats later adopted this nationalism to create new bonds with their subjects. For instance, the Romanovs and Hanoverians began identifying as Great Russians and English respectively. This conservative nationalism extended to European colonies in Asia and Africa where colonized peoples were invited to adopt national identities but were excluded from movements challenging colonial rule. Partha Chatterjee's work Nationalist Thought and the Colonial World critiques Anderson's model by exploring the relationship between anti-colonial and metropolitan nationalisms. Chatterjee argues that anti-colonial nationalisms borrowed from and differed from European models. He examines how Indian nationalists filtered European ideas through an ideological sieve to create a unique form of nationalism. Nationalist thought often becomes the official ideology of post-colonial states, yet it typically excludes certain groups through legal and educational systems. Movements by women, peasants and caste and class-based groups highlight the gap between the nation's rhetoric and reality. The term subaltern refers to the demographic majority in India that is not part of the elite. Kanja Ilaya's book Why I Am Not a Hindu describes Dalit Bahujans as the exploited and suppressed majority in India. Nationalism is not a monolithic phenomenon but is fragmented by internal divisions. To understand nationalism, one must examine how subaltern groups contributed independently of the elite. Historical studies in South Africa by scholars like W. N. Macmillan and C. W. De Kiviet show how colonized peoples resisted and were incorporated into capitalist society, influencing the development of class, race, and state structures. Nationalism, thus, is broader and more complex than its own narratives and shaped by diverse people, stories, and perspectives. Shahid Amin's book Event, Metaphor, Memory revisits the 1922 Chauri Chaura incident where an angry mob burned 23 policemen to death, prompting Gandhi to suspend the anti-British struggle. Amin connects peasant nationalism with the Gandhian movement by reconstructing local memories and cultural history of the event. Timothy Brennan, in his essay The National Longing for Form, emphasizes the importance of a certain nationalism in understanding post-colonial societies. Writings from the so-called Third World critique the nation-state's inclusive gestures and expose its excess. Neil Lazarus supports Frederick Jameson's view that in the third world, the nation is the terrain where cosmopolitan intellectualism and popular consciousness can intersect. Salman Rushdie's novel, The Moor's Last High, illustrates the nation as an inclusive entity, degenerating into communal violence. 
the character of the moor reflects the impossible split between his black moorish identity and his europeanized mask reminiscent of shakespeare's othello the political significance of the nation depends on the relationship between individual nation states and globalization and a colonial thought has not always linked shared racial or cultural memory with the nation as a distinct political entity the negative movement for example envisions nation as a shared culture and subjectivity across political boundaries sartre identified a collective black consciousness in the poetry of several black writers fanon criticized the negative movement for producing literature that reassured colonial powers Gilroy's The Black Atlantic explores a transnational black culture critiquing ethnic absolutism and cultural nationalism. He argues that the nation often serves as the primary site of material production and political control and rebellion. Gilroy traces a shared culture of blackness, a black Atlantic rooted in shared historical experiences and geographic movements of black peoples. through the colonial period rather than any racial essence salman rushdie's novel explores the complex interplay between nationalism and globalization highlighting the challenges posed by the global resurgence of nationalisms and the globalization of different nations in feminist literature discussions on reproduction often overlook the reproduction of national ethical and racial categories under colonial rule the image of the nation or culture as a mother evoked both female power and helplessness arguments for a women's education in both metropolitan and colonial contexts relied on the logic that educated women would become better wives and mothers However these women were also taught not to overstep their bounds and usurp men's authority colonial and indigenous patriarchies often collaborated to keep women in subordinate positions despite their differences this collaboration does not mean that gender ideologies are more fundamental than class or race ideologies it highlights that women are not just a medium for colonial and colonized men to navigate their relationships but constitute at least half of any nation's population and the colonial struggles varied in their approaches to female agency and women's rights in latin america machismo posed significant problems for women in political struggles Similarly the black consciousness movement was often aggressively macho conversely Gandhi's non-cooperation movement in India mobilized large numbers of women and adopted traditionally feminine attributes leading it to be considered proto-feminist women responded in various ways to these movements often fighting in anti-colonial struggles either as followers or leaders though not always feminist these women by being politically active and working outside domestic spaces opened new conceptual spaces for women's roles women's struggles for equality continued after formal independence shaping the nature of post coloniality and colonial nationalisms legitimized women's public activity making their participation in politics more accepted in post colonial countries than in metropolitan ones however celebrating female militancy or political participation uncritically can be problematic the key question is for what purpose women's agency is used the relationship between women nation and community is highly variable both during and after the colonial period issues of women's rights and autonomy complicate the celebration of anti colonialism and nationalism post colonial women's movements aim to highlight their indigenous roots and challenge the notion that their activism is solely inspired by western counterparts they seek to rewrite indigenous histories appropriate pre colonial symbols and amplify women's voices however there is a danger of overlooking the patriarchal aspects of indigenous cultures which are often reinforced by post colonial states and fundamentalist groups post colonial women's movements today must navigate the dynamics of globalization and the post colonial nation state globalization often reproduces the effects of colonialism 
making third world women and women of color the most exploited workers global economic and political imbalances profoundly shape feminist agendas in the post colonial world as these movements are influenced by both local and global movements post colonial theory has faced criticism for being too pessimistic partly due to its connection with post modernism in her essay can the subaltern speak gayatri spivak argues that recovering the voice of the subaltern or oppressed colonial subject is impossible however choosing between pessimism and optimism is unnecessary the concept of a sadi or widow in colonial india is often associated with silence and oppression the stories of survivors are complex and not straightforward testimonials to female agency as agency often means oppositional consciousness feminist theory and historiography face challenges because women often lack the opportunity to fully author their texts the concept of the subaltern under colonialism is not just about collaboration or opposition but involves forming alliances across the colonial divide africans have always been active in making their histories and history is seen as a process that enables alliances across the colonial divide rather than a simple dichotomy between the powerful and powerless to hear subaltern voices we must uncover the multiplicity of narratives hidden by grand narratives while considering how these stories are interconnected rosalind o handlen and david washbrook argue that subaltern historians in india often construct an essential peasant identity not fractured by gender class or location differences john scott's essay on experience is useful because it argues that experience is constructed not merely given identity and experience are not static inner forces but aspects of our changing selves historians of colonialism debate how to balance uncovering subaltern agency with some suggesting that older historical methodologies were more effective oral histories are important for understanding africans roles in forming oppressive and oppositional discourses though they are also mediated by scholars is it possible to achieve objectivity in making the subaltern speak our present day commitments inevitably color our interests in the past we seek to recover subaltern voices to change contemporary power relations but we should not measure our radicalism by simply finding resistance in any text or historical situation the concept of resistance and speaking is often used without understanding what is being resisted or the process of resistance this narrow focus can limit our understanding of african history by denying their aspects of life to the people resisting spivak suggests that because the subaltern cannot speak post colonial intellectuals must represent them stuart hall offers another interpretation the supposed passivity of the subalterns constantly disrupts and limits everything else post modernism and post colonial studies have been criticized for inadequately understanding or changing our world to think about colonialism and its aftermath we need both marxist and post structuralist perspectives the subaltern studies project challenges colonialism through a combination of marxism post structuralism gramsci and foucault incorporating the modern west and india archival research and textual criticism